this week till next Sunday, three things to remember. Is that okay? The first is your daily reading and devotion. All right? If you are not following it, we encourage you to follow that. Sunday, I'll be preaching from any of the passage from the daily reading. I'm not determined because I'm going to base it on my own devotion. So what I will do next Sunday is I'm going to put a whiteboard up here and I'll ask you all to tell me what did you learn from that particular text. Which text? Any of the last six days from Monday to Saturday. Any of them, all right? So we're going to do that. You will share with me uh, and one another and then we'll work from there. Is that okay? So if I don't do well, it's not my fault, it's your fault because you didn't do your job. I'm just joking, but I will prepare my part, but I want to encourage you to learn to read the Word of God first for yourself and not so much just from the pastor uh, because we all need to learn to uh, s chew on the food, swallow the food. If not, you'll be called a baby, all right? Baby are fat. Uh, adults eat on their own. So we want to ask you to learn to read the Word of God guided by the Holy Spirit. Now the second thing that we want you to remember, so every day, read the scripture reading. Second thing we want to ask you to remember is on Friday, on Friday, say me Friday, Friday, come for the prayer meeting. Of course, Tuesday, the school one, that one we have been announcing it. We hope you're catching it. Make it this Tuesday. And then Friday, we're going to come with the other churches to pray. So do join us uh, in that prayer. It's important that we come together twice a year that we, we intercede with the churches, we, we just be engaged and, uh, and, and it is significant because when we come together, God watch, uh, God look for unity among His people. We are not uh, that church, my church, we are one body. So come for that. And of course, next week on Sunday, what time do you come? 10 not 10.20, eh? not 10.30, not 10.35, it's 10.15. All right, we encourage you to be punctual. I know many of you will be lining up at uh, uh, Surrey Complex, queue up uh, at 10 o'clock when it open, open, you come and do that. Do that. But don't queue up at 10.15 because there's no queue anymore. So don't come in at 10.15. Come before 10.15. Have a quick fellowship. Um, the first service would have finished by, uh, they would have waited for 10 o'clock uh, and they will leave. So you once, once the border open, you come in, you'll be fine. Is that okay? Not, not bothered to Miriam, bothered into uh, Banda, okay? All right, don't get excited, all right? It's not a prophecy that you can go Miri, all right? Don't, don't try that, you get into trouble. Now with that, let me bring you to the Word of God. I'm going to talk about equipping the saints. Let's pray. Father, as we look at your Word, as we study your Word together, I pray, God, that you would teach us, teach us, oh God, your Word, that your Word would shape us from inside out, that it would make us, mold us to be Christ-like, we sang the song earlier. Lord, we want to be like you. We want to have your character. We want to have your ministry. We want to serve people like you. We want to love people like you. We want to pray like you. We want to know the Father like you. So Lord, open our eyes to your word to know that you have enabled us in every sense of the word to be like you. So bless this time in Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. So I want to talk about equipping the saints. This is a scripture reading. This is the theme for the year. In 2020, we look at present to God, present to people, loving God, loving people. This year, we're going to focus on equipping the saints. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 16, it says this, And he himself, God, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come together to the unity of God, or to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, 
that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in a cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth to the body for the edifying of itself in love. The team is equipping the saints. Now, I want to highlight this word. It says, equipping the saints. Say with me, equip the saints. Now, often when we think of saints, we think we need to attain sainthood. But I want to highlight this verse. It doesn't say equipping the believers to become saints. But it says this, equip the saints. Do you hear me on that? Equip the saints. It doesn't say it's equipping the Christian, you and I, to be saints. Now that is mind-boggling to us. We say, what? Say it again? We don't quite catch it. Why? Because often when we think of saints, we think of saints like what we see here. People who are super holy. They are the super Christian. They have, they have reached or they are prayer life, they are constantly in prayer, and some of them are in certain places, up in the mountain, in a cave, they are praying throughout the year. That's all they do. And they, they, they are fasting all the time, and they are super holy, they will go into the desert, and, you know, and just be uh, uh, you know, monks and uh, uh, hermits in the desert, uh, in the bush, nothing. They don't eat, they hardly eat, they eat grass, all right, they, they, they eat honey from, from the, uh, they eat lockers. And so we see them as the saints. And of course, when we think of saints, we think of people who can perform miracles, uh, who live a certain life, uh, who are often called to singlehood all their life. I says, wow, that's saints. So they all work towards it. They work hard. They, they strive to be holy. And therefore, we call them saints. I want to say this. That's not what the Bible says. We have this picture, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says this. Each and every one of you here is a saint. Do you hear me? If you believe in Jesus, if you ask Jesus into your life, you are a saint. You catch me? It says for the equipping of the saints. It doesn't say equip believers to become saints. Make them so holy that we can call them saints. That we can elevate them. They can be called saints and these are not saints. Right? Because the church in the past has come to the place where they, they would elevate people to be saints and the rest, these are the saints, these 10, very few would achieve this so high, only a few get to be called saints. The rest are just commoners. You're just normal Christian. This one are saints. But if you read the scripture properly, it doesn't work that way. The Bible doesn't say you are, you have worked so hard, you become saints. You who are commoners, you know, you do the normal things, you work it, you are lawyers, you are doctors, you are teachers, you are housewife, but you are just normal Christian. So, wow, the one in the desert, the one who is doing miracles, the one who, who could do special things, who has special connection to God, wow, they are saying, no, it doesn't do that. The Bible doesn't have two standards. The Bible has one. They are all saints. It's not equip believers to be saints. It's to equip the saints to do certain work. So I want you to understand that because often when we think of it, cannot be. How can I be a saint? I am still struggling with certain sin. I am still not perfect. I still don't pray. I, I still don't know how to pray aloud. When, when just now Pastor Province says pray together, I don't know what to pray. Pray for what? 
So we struggle with it sometimes. How can I be a saint? But I want to say this very clearly to you. You are saint, not by achievement. It is, we received it. Could you turn to your neighbor and look at him or her eyeball to eyeball? Can you seriously call him a saint? No way, man. I look at Pravin, I look at myself in the mirror, no way. Can you look at him one more time and say, are you sure you're saying? You're not so sure, right? No conviction. But I want to say this very clearly to all of you here. If there's anything we want to begin as we look at this team, it is to understand you and I are saying, not because we achieved it, but because we received it. If you think you have achieved it, you're totally wrong. You're saved by law then. And which no one will be saved by law. We are saved by grace. In 1 Corinthians 15, 10, it tells us this, that in ourselves, we are not, we are unworthy. We are unworthy. We're not good enough. We, we, we have done wrong. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. It's by the grace of God, I am what I am. What I am means this is what God calls you. God calls you a son or a daughter. God calls you a saint on the same breath, not because you are worthy, but because Jesus has finished the work by dying on the cross, gave his life for us, forgave every sin you and I have in the past, in the present, and when we future, when we confess every sin to him, he forgives all. And that's why we can stand before God as holy people, not because we are holy in our action, but we are made holy because Jesus has forgiven every sin in our life. Now, I'm not saying we don't try to be a better person, to try to improve. No, that is part of Christianity. But first thing first, we are first forgiven of all our sin. And therefore, we are set apart. Saints are people who can come into the presence of God and know that we are forgiven people. Not perfect, but forgiven. So the understanding of sin is set apart for God, meaning we can stand in the presence of God and say, God, you accepted me. I'm holy. I'm, I can stand before you. And that's about it. Not because I can do miracles, I can pray better. While well, those are all important, you hear me correctly, prayer, miracles are all important. But first thing first, we are saints because we have been given the sainthood. Because Jesus has finished the work. Now, would you turn to your neighbor and look at him again? Same person and says, you are a saint. Are you serious? Can you call me Saint Johnny today? Hey, Saint Karen, do you hear me or not? What's it? Whoa, shake, man. Woo. Imagine I say to Uncle Ben, hey, Saint Bennett. Whoa, different, right? But you know what? That's how Jesus look at us. That's how the Father look at us. That's how the Holy Spirit look at us. That's why the Bible says the Holy Spirit dwell in you and I. Hey, is it because I'm clean? No, because I'm forgiven. That's why the Holy Spirit can dwell in us because we are saints. So therefore, each and every one of you are called saints. So tomorrow you can go to work and tell your colleague, I'm saint uh, Mary. Whoa! Whoa! They were like shocked, man. But the truth is this. You are a saint. First and foremost, because Jesus has done the work. Not because we, re we work to achieve it. Right? So we have received it. I want to establish this so that you know your identity. Because your identity will set you apart. Your identity will set you into a position of power, of grace, of love. The more you know who you are, the more you love God, the more you love God, the more you can walk with Him. But if you are, you're not sure, say, I don't know who I am, I'm still struggling, you know, I don't think I'm forgiven, then you're in trouble. We must begin in the right posture. We must understand that. So equip the saints is not equipping you to be saints. It's equip the saints to three things, right? So the, the, the apostles, the teachers are called to equip you and I uh, to three things. First, equip towards maturity. Second, 
equipped towards love, care, and unity in the church, the body of Christ, not just in San Andrew's church, but with other churches even. Number three, equipped towards ministry and evangelism. Let me go one by one at this. The first is equipped towards maturity. And here it says that we shall no longer be children. All right? Tossed to and fro by the, uh, the wind and so forth, by the doctrine, by the deception. It's drawn. But instead, be matured. Be strong, be like Jesus. Stand firm that when changes come, we are still firm. We are still strong. Let me ask you this question. Who disciple you? Process that a little bit. Who disciple you? Some of us would think, what, what do you mean? Who disciple you? He said, no one disciple me. Now, let me say this, it's not true. The understanding of disciple is someone or something get to speak into your life consistently and intentionally. And Jesus practiced discipleship. He had 12, he had 72. He speak into their life consistently, influencing them, shaping their life. But now take Jesus out of the picture. Who influence you? Who speak into your life consistently? Is okay, my mother, my father. Yes, that's correct. Whether you're like another parent, you are discipling your children, good or bad. It doesn't matter. You're speaking to their life. But who else disciple you? Your teachers speak into your life. Who shape your life? Can I push it a little bit more? The world disciple us. What you read online, the news, the movement, what we call the Bible uh, culture in the Bible, is another word is used. It says the spirit, the spirit of the world, meaning that culture that is quietly influencing us, pushing us, shaping our life without us realizing it. That's what is discipling us. And that comes constantly and shapes us. And after a while, we think in a certain way. You know, give me, let me give you an example. The older generation, our father's generation, are people who work hard. Whatever they earn, they will save. And that's, they were shaped by the culture then, meaning poverty was real. But today's culture, the young generation today, is different. Whatever you earn, what do you do? Not all. Not all, we spend. After the first service, after I preached it, someone says, I, I think I shouldn't buy. I said, why? I said, because you mentioned the word mature. I think I'm not matured. Sometimes it is real, right? Whatever we earn, we spend. It's shape because this world is a materialistic generation. The wave is different. The spirit of the world today is different. It's materialism, it's relativism. Nothing is right, nothing is wrong. It's up to you to decide what is right, what is wrong. Who cares what people say? That's the world discipling us. We get a lot of people who disciple us. We sometimes get problems discipling our life, our circumstances. It happens enough, it becomes real. Our past sometimes disciple us without us knowing it. Some of us, you know, when I was growing up, uh, even becoming a Christian, I was very negative in everything I think. Everything I see is always from this lens called negative. He's rich, he's a bad guy. He's poor, he's a good guy. Uh, he looks fat, he's ugly, uh, which is all wrong. I, and if he's dark, uh, if he's not, he's not friendly. So all sort of things. Certain race, I see it in a certain way. Why? Because we are shaped by our past, by our hurts. That's what can disciple us. And so let me ask you, what or who disciple you? You may not realize it, but there's someone, something, something in your life around you that disciple you all the time. That's why Paul says, be equipped towards maturity. In the time of Paul, the church were discipled by something. One of them is pride. They were all excited. 
They all had gifts and they were all fighting for position. They were all shaped by the culture in their time. You know, if you read the Corinthians, sexual immorality was a real rampant issue. If you read it carefully, right? It was sexually immoral. The church was even doing it. Why? They says that's what the world does. There's a second thing that shaped them. Their past, their tradition. That's why they fight over issues like food. Uh, should you be circumcised? Why? Because the past, our history, our traditions, including the church tradition, sometimes disciple us. And so they struggled. And Paul has to step in and say, this is rubbish. Follow the word of God. And therefore, let me bring you and ask you this. Who disciple you? Let me ask you to do this. You must be discipled by the word of God, meaning you must be discipled by God. It can be through our leaders, but it must be, at the end of the day, the word of God. That's why our daily coming to God, slowing down, be still before Him, is crucial. Without it, we will never grow. Without it, we will always remain as an infant, always depending on someone to tell us. And sometimes the someone who tells us is not necessarily telling us the right thing. But it doesn't matter if he looks the best, he can speak the best, he's, he, he has a lot of knowledge, he must know something. So we are discipled by them. But don't. It must be first, God's Word. You must learn to read it. Right? When we are discipled by God's Word, we are transformed. It's not just knowing. It's being changed, transformed in our actions and in our thinking. Let me stress this. Right? Repentance is a huge part of our life, of Christian life. When we sin, we go, when we, if, let's say I'm going this way when I'm sinning. Repentance means I must turn. 180 degree and walk back with God. That's repentance. And often when we think of repentance, we think of things I've done wrong. The lies, the slanders, the gossip. Uh, uh, I've cheated someone. I could not say sorry. I've said something harsh to my wife. I have to say sorry to her. And so we, and that's right. Actions is important. Us got to forgive our action. But can I highlight this? It's not just our action. It is also in our thinking. Do you realize that? Often it's not the action, it's the thinking, it's the emotion. What is within? We think wrongly, we do wrongly. If I look at someone, I say, I don't like him, what do you do? Very likely you will sin against him. You will say hard words against him. You will say unkind things about him. But if you say, I'm going to think correctly, he is a child of God. Oh, he, sorry, let me, let me correct it. Uh, he is made in the image of God. He is made in the image of God. Then would you say harsh thing, unkind thing, rude thing against him? You would not. I love the illustration when I, I, I must have shared this before. When I was a youth, uh, I was taught this, if you see a pretty girl, what do you do? What? You heard what my wife said? <laughs> At the girl. Pretty girl walking down the street, you whistle. No, no, you don't whistle. My wife is just joking. My wife will scold me if I do that, you know. This is what you do. I was taught when I was a youth. If you see a pretty girl, just pray a prayer. Say, God, thank God that you made every woman in your image. Hallelujah. And walk away. <laughs> you know why that's important? Because if you don't, huh, you look a second time or a third time, you, funny things enter your mind. You don't want that. And that's where sin takes place. Look at the story of David. Where did sin begin? He saw, he entertained it in his thought, and it led to action. Adam and Eve, how did they sin? They saw the devil discipled their mind, in their mind, and they believed, influenced, shaped by the lies, and they followed. It is first the thinking. Because in the thinking, it shapes our inner life. Our emotions, our actions. It shapes us in. The more you think wrongly, the deeper you get. And sometimes we, it becomes what we call pattern. You know, patterns you cannot break away. Patterns, if you have been hurt before, you always look at someone uh, who's like that, you always feel, whoa, cannot trust that person. Cannot, if you're hurt by a man, 
You always look at the man who cannot be trusted. Man cannot be trusted, right? If you come from a broken family, you say family is not good. Family is lousy. It's always, always broken. I don't want a family. And so it becomes a pattern. If we think long, it becomes deep. And it's where we need inner healing. God to heal us from within. And you must always have two things. Word of God, prayer with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will take these two things, work it into our hearts, reveal things to us, shape us from inside out. That's what it is all about. So we need to understand that. So let's understand, not, don't just repent in your action, but in your, how you think. So I have, if you realize in the last few sermons, first sermon of the year, I've highlighted there's a deception we think, or very common. We think like this. When I want something good in my life, what must I do? And sometimes it means if it's against God's word, I will disobey. Why? Why do I disobey? Why do I tell lies? Because I think God cannot be trusted completely. Yeah, I can, salvation, but to get the best in my life, I think I need to take things into my own hand, to be happy and to reach my full potential, I have to trust myself only. I have to control my life. God, ah, God only wants to bring me to heaven, but on earth, He wants me to suffer. He would give the best to that person, but not to me. So we don't quite trust God. And that's sometimes a very quiet, very subtle thinking. Watch your action. You will realize it is very true. The second, of course, I've just mentioned it, that we think we have to earn. We have to earn, we have to work hard to be a saint, to be a child of God. Let me say this. Our identity is huge. If your identity is wrong, you will live wrongly. You will struggle. You will fight. Because when we have no clear identity, we always think God treats one better than the others. And so we always compare. Let me say this, comparison, while there is some place for healthy comparison, but most cases, comparison is one of the most toxic habits. You hear what I'm saying? One of the most toxic habits. He has bigger car, he's more blessed. Bigger house, I have smaller house, better children, smarter, do better at result, what do we do? We feel small. We feel, God, how come God, you don't answer my prayer? And so we're always comparing. Wow. Comparing, comparing. Oh, he gets to work in somewhere else. I get to be in Brunei. Yeah. I have to study in UBD. They go, wow, Melbourne, Monash. How come I don't get to go? I go to Trinity Theological College in Singapore. He gets, what's called? What, dollars? Or go America. So we compare. So how come? Well, the church is bigger, newer, better. This one, oh, you're not so good. So we compare all the time. And what happens when you compare? Toxic emotion comes forth. We compare. We cannot appreciate God. We cannot, we cannot appreciate what God has put into our hand. And so we must know our identity. We are a child of God. You are saints. You're not lesser. You are exactly what God has said because He has finished the work. The second thing I want to bring to your attention is this. You are, to you are saints to be equipped towards love, care, and unity. If the Bible tells us this in Ephesians, edifying the body of Christ, speaking the truth in love. The second identity that's given here is this, is that you are part of the body. As long as you're a Christian, you are in the body of Christ. Christ is the head, you are the body. You cannot say, I know, I'm not, I'm not. You are, because God brings you into the body. When you accept Him, you become part of the body. Again, it's not your doing. It's not your achievement. It is God's grace that we become sons and daughters, part of the body of Christ. And so the call to saints is to be, is to be equipped towards love, care, and unity. Right? And we must understand this, this new understanding of who we are in Christ must transform how we relate to people. You catch what I, I said? This new identity in Christ as a saint, as a son or daughter of God, as a, as a part of the body of Christ, we, it must transform how we relate to people. I often say this, hear me correctly on this. 
when I know, when, the more I love Jesus, the more I know who I am. The more I know who I am, the more I will love people. The more I love Jesus, the more I'll love my spouse, my children. The more I love Jesus, the more I will love my parents. I will love my grandparents. I'll love my friends, my colleagues. Can I also turn it the other way around? The less I love Jesus, the less I will know myself. And therefore, I will always struggle who I am exactly. And when I am not secure, the more I will be further from people, the more I will struggle against people that I'm supposed to love. It works that way. And so, Paul teaches us, love God, love people. He connects it two together. Therefore, he says, be equipped. Saints, listen to me, be equipped towards love, care, and unity. And if you, if you understand that, it is very interesting if you have been reading the scripture reading, the daily scripture, there is in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, there's a passage, a very interesting passage. Sometimes we get confused, we get carried away uh, about what exactly is the issue. The issue was quite simple. The issue is food. Food offered to idols. Can we eat it? And so there are two groups. One group says, can, no problem. I am a Christian. Everything is sanctified. In, uh, in fact, it says, uh, in fact, I don't, there's no gods in any of these idols, so no issue. So I can eat it. As long as I give thanks, God sanctify every food. Is that correct? Is that correct? The answer is yes. And Paul says, yes, that's true. And then there's another group that says, but cannot. Cannot. I will get stumbled. How could you eat that? I come from that background. I know what it is. You know, it is, it is, oh, it's not right. Just don't do it. So what do we do? So the one who's been Christian for a while says, who cares? You die, you die. La. Why are you so immature? Just eat. La. Don't be silly. They're all God-given. So what do you do? So you have two groups. And Paul says this. And he didn't say to the weak, he says to the matured, he says matured one, supposedly matured, would you stop fighting? Would you just stop eating those food? But he says, why? It's my right. No, it's not about your right, it's about the body of Christ. If you love, you're matured, you love them, don't eat it. Why do you want to fight over food? Why are you so crazy about food? Just give it up. Is that a big deal? Now, what Paul is telling them is this. The matured love is not just what you know. The matured love comes out in action, in love, in care. Now, the picture of a matured love are parents. Now, it doesn't mean that you are not parents, you cannot be matured, but we all know what is parental love because all of us have parents here. What does parents do? The parents sacrifice. Can you picture... This father and the daughter, let's say my daughter is young, and my daughter wants to eat the ice cream. I bought ice cream bag. says, it's mine. I bought it for myself. And then my daughter says, I want the ice cream. I want it. I said, no, it's mine because I paid for it. You didn't pay for it. This is $5 ice cream. Expensive. Hagen dust. I love Hagen dust. Hagen dust. You cannot touch it. It's mine. But my daughter says, I want it. Daddy, I want it. I said, no, get away. Can you picture that? Can you accept that? No, right? Because you expect a father to be mature enough. If she wants it, have it. Lah. But maybe, let me take two bites first, then you can have it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, I like it. So very difficult to sacrifice, but I will. Okay, lah, I love you more than ice cream, so have it. That's what I would do, right? You would do that too if you are a father or a mother, or you know you've seen it in your parents. Why? It's no longer my right. It's not my right. It's family. That's what Paul is saying. That's for, Paul called us to maturity and part of maturity is that we can love, care, unite. Always building one another up. If it doesn't build up, don't do it. Mature love means you know what is essential. 
what is important, what is not. Food, not important. Of course, doctrine is a different thing. That's where we sometimes have to stand firm. But food, no, can give up. That's what matured love is all about. And I pray that you too will grow in maturity, that we will learn to accept one another. Because sometimes in ministries, in church, we fight over small things. You, you, how come you give him that task? Huh? You don't give me. Huh? How come you, he get it? I don't get it. Why we fight over small things? Why? Because we do not know who we are in Christ. We don't know our identity. We struggle. But we are already at a platform where you're called a saint. Wow! It's not, huh? It's wow! That's what saints. Everyone stand and says, wow, to saints. Because you are saints of God. So, equip and first ma towards maturity. Equip towards unity, love, and care. And this is the third. Listen to me. It's equipped towards ministry and evangelism. It says the effective working of which every part does its share causes growth to the body. Can I ask you this question? Who does the work of ministry in the church? Process that a little bit. Who does the work of ministry in the church? Do you process that? Who? Sometimes we say it's the pastor, lah, of course. He's paid, lah. Can you picture, oh yeah, someone dying in the hospital. Who should go? Pastor, lah, of course. He's paid and he know what to do. Hey, pastor, go and give me visit someone dying. How come we don't say, I go? Yeah, pastors would come. We would be there. But why can't we say, I go? Someone is sick. Someone is hospitalized. Why do we always say, hey, pastor? Uh, so and so in hospital. Can you go and visit? Why can't we say me? Bible study, teaching. Pastor, you do it. La. Why can't we say I can do it too? Of course, if we are ready. Why can't we say that? Because if you read this carefully, this passage carefully, it says this. Listen to me carefully on this. Don't miss this. It says the pastors, the prophets, the apostles, the teachers, all this, their main task is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. It doesn't say this. It doesn't say the pastors, the teachers are to do all the work of ministry and die with it. Full stop. No. It says they equip. My role, therefore, the pastor's role, yes, we do the work, but the major part is for us to equip, to train, to preach, to help people grow so that they can do the work of ministry, not the other way around. And sometimes we don't quite catch it. Now let me say this, the answer is all the saints, meaning all of you, all of you who are saints are called to do the work. You know, we, let me celebrate this. We're going to, uh, we, we, we're going to pray for the leaders. Today is a Sunday where we're going to dedicate the leaders as they enter uh, as we're already in 2021 as they serve in care groups in children ministry youth ministry uh, and worship team different and uh, different ministry uh, later i will name the ministry they're going to serve i'm going to ask you to think about this now i want to say all of you must understand this principle because all of you to, are called to serve some of you are called to serve in your own home in church in a community in school in our community where all of you are called to serve no one is exempted. Okay, I want you to understand this. The first thing is build an altar. Now, I, I'm going to draw from the lesson of Noah. When Noah, Noah was on the ship in the ark, the whole earth was flooded for almost a year. And when the ark finally landed on dry ground, most, uh, Noah and the family came out. There were three things that we can learn immediately. There were two things that he did, or three things rather. The first is this. The first thing he did was he built an altar. And building an altar is very significant because it is where you invite God's presence into your life. 
where you give thanks and worship, where you acknowledge God that He is your God, and you rededicate your life to God, your purpose, whatever you are doing, that's the building of the altar. And you and I must learn to build altar. Sunday is a time of building altar. The, the time with your family, the family altar, is a time of building altar where we learn to pray with our children, or just read a scripture passage. Right? So do that with your parents. Whatever scripture that is given, read it, choose. You know, if you cannot read 50 verses, read a short. We have purposely have a New Testament short, read together and pray together. You don't, you don't have to expound it. You just say, hey, we learned this today. And just share. That's family altar. We need to rededicate our family to God. Lead our family. And Noah did just that. Building an altar. But there's a second thing he did. The second thing is this. He planted, the Bible tells us, a vineyard. The question is, why a vineyard? Why not? A wheat field, that's the immediate need, right? You need wheat to make bread. Why don't you do that? But instead, the Bible tells us that he planted a vineyard. Now, the Bible doesn't explain why, but if we are correct, this is what it is. A, a wheat field would only be one round. You plant it, the fruit is, the fruit is produced one time and it's gone. You need to replant again. But vineyard is different. When you plant it once, it will reproduce and it will produce and produce. The fruits remain. It is long term. And if we are correct about this, no one understood the principle of investment. When you invest, you invest in a long term. You invest in things that will go even before you. And even when you're no longer on this earth, it will still remain. It becomes a legacy for you and your family and honoring God with it. And he did just that. And therefore, let me challenge all of you here. Have you built an altar this year? Second, all, I'm not talking about just the leaders, everyone, have you planted a vineyard? In a sense, did you invest well? I use the word invest well. Invest well has to be God's way and in what is permanent. We can invest badly. Let me tell you that we can invest in wrong emotion. We can invest in fight that we should not. We can invest in material things and gain a lot of material things and yet be the poorest person in relationship. We can invest wrongly, in full stop. And we all have invested wrongly. We can invest in wrong thinking. Comparing, we can spend a lot of time worrying. That is a kind, a form of investment, but just a bad one. As long as your energy is put in, that is an investment. And therefore, let me encourage all of you here, as we learn to grow in God's word, plant a vineyard, permanent, long-term fruits that will remain. Now, I want to also honor our leaders here. I want to say this, uh, you know, this year, we are celebrating the 90th years of this church. 90 years ago, this church, not here, not the exact site, the bishop consecrated the, uh, in a short lot, right, the house of worship. Right, the Anglican House of Worship, 90 years ago. And I know when I look back, I want to celebrate that. And I want to acknowledge our leaders here too. Let me say this, I'm going to be very clear. In the last 90 years, we have seen our forefathers who have invested and invested. They invested in this land. They've given land. Family have given land to the church, to the school. And that's why we have this here for 71 years, right here. But the church is 90 years old. 71 years at this spot. The school, uh, am I correct, 60 years? Or is it 50? 50. Uh, diamond is 60. 60 over years. Land given, planted, and 
we have seen the fruits and we want to honor God and our forefathers and many leaders who have served in, in this church. You know, there was a time in this church on this side. There was a period of time where there was no residing priest. Meaning the priest was, if I'm correct, living in Miri, he'll come in once every two weeks to, to have the Holy Communion. And therefore, there was no priest here. What do you do when there's no priest? In the past, the, the church is used to the priest. The priest, what we call in Hokkien, Pao Sua Pao Hai. You know what that mean? You don't understand. Pao Sua means Pao Sua is cover the mountain, cover the sea. Everything they do, right? Visitation to preaching to teaching, everything is just a priest. Everyone just sit in Kelka and come on Sunday, get preached to us. Make sure it's 10 minutes, okay? If more than 10 minutes, we will crucify you, kill you, kill you. And it was a bit like that, right? So it was like that. But you know, there was a period of time where there was no reciting priest. And so what happened? The church almost died. But you know what? God has his sense of humor. In that period of time, because there was no priest, the leaders rise up. The leaders, the PCC, begin to rise up. They begin to take the pulpit. They begin to teach. They begin to lead the worship. They begin to take part in the church. And the church experienced a, a kind of revival. And the Holy Spirit moved. And I want to say with pride, that's why we are what we are today. And we are still growing. We're not there, but we have come to this place and that's God's work. But I want to honor the leaders of this church, the, those who are no longer leaders, inclusive. They work hard. They gave their life. They planted a vineyard with their money, with their resources, their talent. And they gave and they gave. That's why you and I are here today. And I will say it very clear. That's why I'm here today as a priest, as a pastor. And you know where some of you will know this part? I became a Christian. Part of the journey is through this church. But the crossing of the line is not the church. It's a school where they used to organize church camp within the school. And therefore, if I would say the chaplaincy work, that's what it is. Christian work, Christian ministry within the school. That's where I became a Christian. And you know what? Reverend Stephen is one of them. And many of you is one of them. That is where it is planting of a vineyard. We sow into God's work. We sow into lives. You know what? The day will come. I will die. All Jesus returned before I die. I'll go into heaven. I'll see some of these people that have gone before us. And I'll be proud to say they are people who has planted a vineyard. The question is this. What about you? Would you plant a vineyard, not just a wheat field, but a vineyard, so that it will be permanent? Some of us say, but I have nothing. Can I say carefully on this? Let me say with love, if you ever say that I, I, know, but I have no place to serve, I don't, What's there for me to serve? I want to relate this to the parable of the talent. There's one servant with five talent. One with two. One with one. The first two did well. And we know people who have five talents. It's, wow, this guy got five talents. We know people who have two talents. Wow, he swiped something. But sometimes we with one talent says, I got nothing. Lah. God didn't give me anything, so I no need to serve. Nothing. What can I do? Well, I don't know. I can't do anything. But let me say this. It's not true at all. It's a lie. Don't believe that. If you ever say, I have nothing, I cannot serve. No. One talent is important. One talent is important. One talent is a lot. But what we need to do is be faithful. Be faithful with it. Do you know what the servant says? Well, because he has one talent, he compares with his colleagues and says, they got five, I got two, I don't have only one. So what did he do? He dug a hole, buried it. Why did he dug a hole and buried it? You read carefully, he's basically, when he did that, he did one thing very toxic in the thinking. Not in the action, in the thinking. He says this, when the master returned, he says, Master, I've dug a hole, buried it. So make sure it's safe. You know why? Because I don't feel safe with you. Listen to me. I dug a hole, buried a talent, so that when you come back, I'll return it to you. Why? Because I don't feel safe with this talent because I don't feel safe with you. I don't trust you. 
you're not good, you're weaker. You really carefully say, you, you get what you don't belong to you. You're a wicked master. I don't trust you. But was the master wicked? No. It is in his mind. His thinking. And sometimes we can be like that. No talent. So talented. You can play music. I can't. Not talented. Let me say this. Every one of you here are called to serve. Meaning every one of you has been given at least one talent. And your role is simple. Faithful and good with it. That's it. If you are good at smiling, shaking hands, be in the hospitali hospitality ministry. Look at my face. Do I look like I'm smiling? <laughs> but I have to learn to shake hands, you know, when I come to you, I say, big fist bump. I'm, psh, and the children like me, not because I smile good, but because I can do fist bump and fire well. You can do it better than I. Simple. You all have talent. Therefore, plant a vineyard. The third is this. Noah did a third thing. And this is not good. The Bible tells us this. He took the fruit of the vine, grapes, the wine. He drained and drained and drained. He, be, he got drunk. And because he got drunk, he did something that shamed himself, shamed the family, and shamed the legacy of Noah and his family. The family is never the same because of that shame. This is what we must learn when we serve. The third is this, we must maintain discipline. Sometimes we get excited. We have been in lock, the border has been locked for good more than one year, almost a year. Can you imagine when the door opened, what would we do? I can guarantee all of you will flock into Miri one time or another, maybe more. But be careful if you flock into Miri. Maintain discipline. Because the chance is, once we get this freedom, wah, we lose every discipline. Sort of, or we, we do things that we should not do. Somehow, the excitement, the, 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 the adrenaline kicks in. We do things we should not. And that's what Noah did. He lost the discipline. Don't. As we serve God, let's not be disqualified. Let's finish the race well. And so this is where I want to ask of you as you consider these three things. You are saints, you are called to maturity and that begins with the word of God. The second is this, let God mature you that we will love one another, equip to love, serve and care one another. Care for one another. The third is this, that we will be equipped to serve in the ministry, in evangelism, you and I can reach people that I can never reach. If it's only depend on one or two, many will be lost. Many will be lost. And that's why Jesus called all of us to be disciples. He wants to disciple all of us through His Word. And I pray that this year will be a year of just getting into the Word of God. You may not be good, but you're going to work on it. Work on it until you get better and better. And we will guide you, we will work with you, that you will grow in the Word of God. And so with this, let me bring you to the last picture. This is what we want to happen in your life. This is the picture of being equipped as saints for the work of God, for maturity, for unity looks like. It begins with life in Christ, that we know who we are, that we are saints. We grow into His likeness, but we begin to love others at the same time. We're in a community, we serve with joy as servants. And then we share Christ with other people. That we will be able to answer questions in season and out of season because we have learned to be with God. So I'll, let me pray for you and I'll call the leaders up. I hope the cool leaders are getting ready. Are they getting ready? Right, let, let me pray with you all. Let me just ask you to be quiet for a moment. Let's just allow God to, allow the word of God to sing to your heart. Would you be able to say, I'm a saint? Do 
Do you know the cross? Do you know the empty tomb? Do you know the finished work of Jesus is what makes you saint? Yes, there's a need to live a life that pleases God. But first thing first, you'll be made a saint. And saints are to be equipped to be trained so that we grow into maturity, knowing God's word, transforming our actions and in our thoughts. Can I ask you, if there are sins in your life, ask God to forgive you. But not just what you did, but what you taught that is wrong, that is sinful. And you're called to be equipped to love, care, to unite. It's not about me. It's about the body of Christ. It's about Jesus. And third, the call to serve. How can I serve? What talent has God entrusted me? God has given me talent. I have talent because I am a child of God. I'm a saint. Whether it is at home, here, in a care group, in the ministry, at your workplace, I want to serve you, God. Small ways, a smile, a word of encouragement, my prayer for someone else, me being on a prayer meeting, they're all serving you, God. Teach me, Lord, to, to know my identity in you, that I'm a saint. And saints are called to maturity. Saints are called to love one another. Saints who are called to serve. All of us here are saints, oh God. So we come before you, God. We want and we learn that we are saints again. Come God, shape our hearts, shape our thinking. Let us be people of your word and let you, through your word, disciple us. That we are saints that are equipped, equipped towards maturity, towards unity and love and care and towards serving you and doing the work of your kingdom. All this we pray in Jesus' most precious and mighty name. Amen.